Um, so that's these are some of the new things that are coming up. All right, so um, you got uh, 40 plus people now. So Claire, can we get started? We can. Wonderful. All right, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Today's Thursday, so Jordan Peterson Thursday. And today we are talking about big five and personality traits and you know personality analysis. And Claire is leading uh, as usual. And I also want to tell you that Roger will be back starting uh, next uh, Thursday. And we are starting a series on maps of meaning uh, where you can read the book as well as, um, as, well as see the videos um, and use that to, to discuss maps of meaning, which is really the heart of Jordan Peterson's work. All right, so with that, Claire, take it away. Thank you, Shrikant. Welcome. Lovely to see some familiar faces here. Welcome to another Jordan Peterson Thursday. This is the final session in our um, section on personality. We've taken a deep dive into some of the, the great theorists. We've talked a lot about philosophy. And this is now going to be kind of the final cherry on top where we're going to talk about big five. And we're going to do it in a way um, that kind of involves us. And, and we're going to get our hands dirty a little bit and really apply these principles to our lives. So it's going to be a really fun one today. I'm excited to be here. And, and thank you all for carving out some time in your day. So in this lecture, um, for those of you that watched, Peterson really begins by discussing the history and the development of modern personality trait theory. And personality theory is really tough because it's emotional, it's loaded, and it's very hard to measure scientifically. So the theory that we're going to talk about today, Big Five, I want to put out this preface that it is not a perfect model. There are many, many, many critiques of Big Five, as well as the other personality models from Myers-Briggs to others. Um, and we could spend meetups talking about those. But what I really encourage you guys to do today is to think about this model in a way that is most helpful to others and have a neutral outlook on it instead of kind of bringing the way that you currently want to express something to the table. So let's just kind of try to clear our minds here um, and think about this model kind of in a vacuum. So in general, um, kind of the high level here is that psychologists kind of discovered in this model that extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience um, are really the key kind of pri priority trait um, categories. And they begin to sort of delineate their social experience and their biological underpinnings. That's what we're seeing going on in this lecture. What has happened in really the first half of the course is that we rounded up a bunch of clinical theorists and personalities. These guys tend much more toward the philosophical. And Peterson points out that this is because he take, is taking more of an engineering rather than a scientific approach to the brain. Because personality, it really does, it straddles science and practice. It's nestled really within a value structure and, and a, an historical mythology. And so sort of this kind of investigation into the philosophical um, realm of value is necessary in order to understand those philosophical theories. And what we're going to do today is we're going to transition really radically into that more scientific and more and more sort of biological realm. Um, and and we'll, we'll dive into this model. We're going to dive deeply into what each of these five categories really mean and how they might, what the implications might be for the lived experience. Um, but first and foremost, and what Peterson really spends the breadth of this lecture doing is explaining how this model works. What is it scientifically based on? Um, so we're going to kind of start there and sort of trudge through this. So um, the, the, the term psychometrics is the study of psychological measurement. Um, and, you know, in, in typical scientific theory, we all did our kind of science, science experiments growing up in, in, in science class. And, and we learn a few things. We learn that you have to use the scientific method in which you kind of have these two groups, you manipulate one, you keep a control group, there's experimentation, there's hypothesis, there's all these steps, but that's kind of how that thing works. Um, and then secondly, and really foremost, as you're, as you're conducting any experiment on these, on these two or multiple groups, you need to come up with a measurement system that is both reliable and valid. 
And it needs to be able to measure the same way across a lot of different multiple, multiple kind of realms of, of measurement. And so when it comes to personality, that's really tough. Um, and what psychometrics aims to do is um, you sort of put a statistically rigorous observation on the study of personality, but it, it lacks an actual model. So typically in science, before you start that experiment, you got to know what that measurement system is. Um, and, and this psychometric model really isn't built on top of a firm kind of um, actual numerical model. It's based on a series of propositions. Um, and, and these are sort of axiomatic propositions that build on top of themselves and they make up the kind of bare bones of this personality dimensions. So what happens with big five is it's broken up into these five different dimensions or traits of personality. Um, and, and what happened when they created this is what psychologists did is they gathered basically every adjective that anyone could use kind of period in the English language. And then they subjected them to factor analysis to determine how similar each adjectives are to, to one another. And what you find when you when you apply this model to a series of people is that that breaks down into really five key dimensions of personality under which you can nestle all the other adjectives. So I'm going to go deeply into some examples of how that works, but that's really the underlying kind of um, uh, concept here. And so think about these traits or sort of dimensions as elements of personality. Think of them as sub-personalities. And so when, when we think of you know, our, our, our unit, our, our individual person, they're made up of these very often disparate personality traits that might be in contrast to one another. Our unity is, is really diverse. And there's, Peterson says, you know, describable stable elements that can, char can characterize you, but they might be in contrast to each, each other. So one example here, are you social or would you rather be alone? This is a very classic question to lend to extroversion. And so what you're gonna do to get this kind of statistical model to work for you is, let's say you're gonna take a hundred questions of you and you're gonna take a hundred questions of another person. And that someone that answers a certain set of those questions, let's say high, let's say seven to eight on a 10 point scale, they are also going to answer the other questions that lend to that same kind of social or would you be along similarly. And what we tend to get here is patterns of co-variation. So for example, two questions that might be similar, one might be, how often do you smile on a scale of one to 10? Okay, how often are you happy? on a scale of one to 10. Both of those questions are different. They're really asking two different things, but when we boil them down to kind of the, that, that pattern of covariation, you're gonna have a very similar outcome um, when we look at people kind of in a larger sample size. So these things, they aren't the same thing, but they're close enough that they happen to be the same thing. And that is was what Peterson refers to as factor analysis. Um, it's, it's math. Um, and so, so what these tests do is they take a large set of questions, they relate them to a large group of people um, and kind of um, you know, make up the difference. Um, and another example here, if, if, um, if you take a group of people and you ask questions how it, regarding sort of how to manipulate abstractions, whether they're whether it's math, whether it's asking what's the capital of X state, whether it's asking history, whether it's asking to kind of differentiate patterns. If you took a set of all those questions across a large group of people and you summed all the responses, you're only going to really settle on one common dimension. And that's kind of that IQ or intelligence based. And so that's why IQ is a really tough test because you're, you're commenting this all down to one kind of simple dimension. And the big five is gonna take five of them and really put them sort of in contrast to each other. So um, what, what this is doing is, is it's, it's trying to take sort of a, a linguistic hypothesis um, in that, you know, if you take the most common 1,000 words, um, Peterson says that about 80% of speech is only made up about, of about 500 words. And so what's happening here is we're taking those most common 1,000 adjectives and then seeing how they're used. 
Um, and so in this way, language becomes kind of a comprehensive representation of personality. It's not exactly everything, right? But it's, it's everything that we can understand about personality that can be wrapped up in language. We know that there's more outside of that, um, but what we're doing is we're, we're kind of amalgamating those ad adjectives in order to get a factor analysis that really you know, presents some sort of a conclusion about personality. So um, what are these five domains? What are these five kind of trait categories? Um, you know, it's important to understand what we mean by, by traits. Um, so as I said, Peterson considers these five domains as, as sort of sub-personalities. They, they act to us as a frame of reference. So um, does, does being around groups of people make you energetic or does it exhaust you? That frame of reference helps to kind of um, uh, influence your life. And that frame of reference, it exists on a spectrum. So this is not a stagnant thing that you are born with it and it never changes. You always have an ability to move your frame of reference. If it's agreeableness, you can slide it right or left, but you're always going to be bound to a range. And that place in which you start is, 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 is static in a certain extent. So you can move it a little bit here, you can move it a little bit here, but that threshold, that range is really consistent and you're always gonna feel most comfortable in kind of that, that the, the, the center of it, right? And where, where you started. So in addition to being a frame of reference, it acts also as a system of values um, and really starts to dictate what you what you value in the world, where you spend your time. Um, so if you if you if you're high in extroversion, you value being with people. That's just the way it is. You value other people. If you're high in openness, there is a cr creative dimension to, to what you value. And if you have a conversation, the likelihood of you talking about ideas or aesthetics with other people is extremely high because that's what you value. That's what you focus on. That's what you're going to want to talk about. Neuroticism, if you're high in neuroticism, you see the world, you value the world as a place potentially of threats, um, and you're going to interact with it as, as such. So these traits, they also um, dictate what kind of goals we set in life. Um, what type of what we aim at, what we're actually trying to accomplish. If you're high in extroversion, Peterson says, you probably like to tell jokes. You like to, to go to parties. You like to be in workplaces that involve communication. And so what we really, what we aim to achieve is also dictated by these traits. Um, there are patterns of behavior. behavior um, and they're also really stable, stable, Peterson says, motiva motivations. They're stable, they remain over time. Um, and uh, Peterson's example here is agreeableness. If you ask someone that's very high, but an agreeableness kind of to tell you about their life or their, their kind of biographic history, they're going to tell you a story of, of the relationships they've had over time, because those have been their stable motivators. That's how they perceive their time to be important. Um, they characterize their life really by relationships. And so um, in this way, these, these traits kind of represent social niches where an extrovert sort of sees the, the place as a, a social niches, as a world of opportunity, something to go towards. Um, and someone who might be low in extroversion sees that, that social niche as something to retreat from. Um, so all of those go to sum up, what are, these, what are these traits? What are these differentiators? What do they act to do? Um, and, and when it comes to kind of applying these, um, Peterson's going to go into some examples about, about how, to, how to use this in your life. And one of the big ones is, is in partnership and in relationship to other people. So when you're in a relationship with any other person, whether that's a coworker or a friend, um, you don't, you, you know, any amount of mismatch is going to create tension. So if you are overly extroverted and your partner is introverted, that's going to create, you know, some, some amount of tension on an ongoing basis because that, you know, that which you value, that's what, that which you focus on is mismatched. It's going to be hard to come to a consensus more often than not. Um, if you kind of, if you isolate an extrovert, they tend to just, Peterson says, wither on the vine. But similarly, you know, introverts do not like large scale interaction that is really draining to them. So you're going to get this kind of dual draining um, quality. Now, that being said, 
You also do not want to surround yourself in life with a bunch of people who are replicas of yourself, right? Who are exactly like you. And, and we really are yet to understand what that proper balance of thriving is. I think this is a really fun thing to kind of hypothesize about of how, how can people that are high in traits that are different than you balance you out and help you grow um, versus when, when is it too dif different where it's going to constitute really a chronic rift that you can't come past and, and it's going to just going to keep arriving, ar arising again and again. It's important to note also that, that um, you know, different traits do well in different times in history. So there are times in history where someone is just fortunate enough to match their temperament or their certain proclivities with the demands of the environment. Um, and, and, and maybe we're, you're, born, you're fortunate enough to be born in areas where it matches that particular, particular um, temperament because there's a there's a normal distribution of all traits and on average across long, like long periods of time in human history the environment has matched these in different ways if you live in a tyrannical society for example being extroverted or being low in neuroticism might be a bad thing it would make you mouthy it would make you fearless that's not something that's gonna um, suit you well just to general survival survival in a tyrannical environment um, but that being said, you can have many different personalities and you can survive as long as your behaviors sufficiently match the environment. Um, and of course, successful adaptation is really going to require this. So let's talk about some of these traits. Um, we're going to talk about these traits. We're going to talk about what these traits mean and kind of the relationship toward them. Um, and then we will pa pause and ask questions. So first, let me give you guys a visual here. Stand by. Okay, hang on. So I'm gonna assume you guys can see my screen unless I hear otherwise. So what we see with this um, graph is how these adjectives kind of roll up. Right. So here we have our five traits, conscientiousness, agreeableness. You can break these down into different facets and within them lie these these 500 to 1000 common, you know, in, um, uh, adjectives that we're using in the in the English language to describe humans or really any sort of interaction. So let's break down some of these traits and see what they really look like. Um, I tried, started to go in order, but then I didn't. So openness. People who are low in, in, in openness tend to be um, more predictable. They're not very imaginative. They're not super hot on change. They prefer routine, more traditional, and they're disliking of some more abstract kind of theoretical concepts. Notice that the way to refer to these traits is not um, openness and closedness. So these don't, they don't exist in contrast to each other, but rather as a scale altogether. So someone who's high in openness is going to be more curative, curious, more imaginative, um, very, everything is kind of going to be more relative and abstract. They're open to trying new things um, and there's more of an unconventional element. So here with openness, this is the creativity trait. Um, people tend to be more liberal who are creative. There's a um, aesthetic sensitivity here. So anything surrounding novelty, fiction, poetry, creativity is really gonna be a more in bolt trait. Um, and let's see if I missed anything there. I think I did conscientiousness. Um, moving on to neuroticism. So those who are low in neuroticism um, are going to be more anxious. Um, there's an irritability, experiences as uh, are, cause a lot of stress. There's a self-consciousness, potentially vulnerability, um, and there might be more dramatic shifts in mood versus someone, uh-oh, I switched this one, huh? This one's wrong. Let's fix it. So th those all describe someone who is high in neuroticism and someone who is low in neuroticism doesn't worry as much. There's a more calm quality, more emotional stability, confidence, resilience, rarely feel sad or depressed. Um, of course, these are all generalizations, but these are gonna be the types of adjectives that you're gonna see showing up on this, this test. You, you handle that very calmly. <laughs> Thank you. Very low in neuroticism when I, when I copied and pasted. Conscientiousness. 
Um, so someone that is high in, comp in, in conscientiousness is going to prepare. They're going to be organized. This is the orderly function. They do not like a messy room. It literally is connected to their, their, their disgust um, reaction. Um, they're going to be achievement striving. They're going to be dutiful, self-disciplined, scheduled, high amount of deliberation required here. On the flip side, low in conscientiousness, you're going to be a little more disorganized, dislike structure, doesn't return things where to where they are. That's a really random one that I found today, um, but I'm very low in conscientiousness, and I will say that that's true. If I just take something and I'm like, okay, well, it, it lives here now. Um, these people procrastinate more. They are um, more kind of in undisciplined, impulsive, uh, and, and reactionary. Agreeableness. Um, so people high in agreeableness have a very high interest in other people. As I said, that this is a value structure. This is how they go through the world. They're high in trust. They're more straightforward. There's an altruistic component to it, higher in modesty, sympathetic, empathy. They're putting others before themselves. They exist more in a 50-50 um, kind of relationship with the world where they expect I'm going to get 50% and everyone else is too. Well, unfortunately, that's not how the world works and they end up getting um, eaten and spit out all sometimes. Um, so on the flip side, um, those low in agreeableness are more skeptical, more demanding, um, stubborn, show off, unsympathetic, don't really care about other people feel as much, more selfish. Um, and this is a, you know, a very um, beneficial trait from an evolutionary perspective. There's obviously some, you know, gender breakdown here, which goes across all of these big five. But the, the stat that Peterson uses with agreeableness is that if you take a population of men and women, a, a large group, let's say a thousand, 60% of women are going to be higher in agreeableness than men. So it's not, that's not huge, but it is a little bit more. Um, and that's something that you tend to see um, kind of uh, coming to fruition in, in relationships as people come, come, come to kind of navigate those personality differences. Extroversion. So those that are high in extroversion enjoy being the center of attention. They like to start conversations. They like to meet new people. They gain energy from groups. They have a wide range of, of friends and acquaintances. They find it easy to make new friends. Again, there's this energy component. Um, and they, they often can some, sometimes kind of just say things without thinking about them or sort of internalizing them in that way. In contrast, those low in introvert in, ex in extroversion. Again, these this doesn't this doesn't mean introversion, right? We really refer to this as low in extroversion. Um, they prefer solitude. Um, they feel exhausted if they have to socialize too much. They they exist in a world of ideas that go on within their brain. Um, they carefully think things through before speaking. They don't love to be the center of attention. They don't love small talk. Um, and they really do need that alone time in order to refuel and really be, be ready to kind of greet the world. So let's talk now about what these things mean. Um, or what they mean kind of when it comes to a lived experience of a human on earth. Let me see if I missed anything really great here. Okay, so these are some, so this is when the research gets a, gets a little hairy, but it's fun because there are, I wanna say thousands of studies based on big five model, trying to show what the implications are, how this relates to outcomes. And a lot of these, these experiments are not great, um, but I think it is just interesting. And so again, take these for a grain of salt, but we're gonna start to kind of see what is the correlation be here, here into how people live their lives. So from a health perspective, there's some studies showing that um, high scores of neuroticism significantly can affect one's risk for mental health disorders and really just health in general. And what we see there is that stress is not good for your heart. It is not good for really any of your organs. Um, and so that high level of neuroticism is often correlated by lower, lower lifespan. Um, when relating to objective health conditions, um, uh, those where which are kind of high in creativity or have more less neuroticism and, and have more optimistic control are are more closely related to physical injuries that are caused by an accident rather than sort of internal underlying health conditions. 
When it comes to academics, no surprise here. Um, the two things that are really going to, well, three things that are really going to impact um, academic performance is openness and conchi. No, not right. Agreeableness and conscientiousness. Of course, IQ is huge there. And Peterson says that the, cor the correlation between creativity and academics is actually zero. And in studies done often in grad school, it's sometimes negative that the higher this level of, of creativity, it really doesn't lend itself to that for more formal academic experience. So conscientiousness and agreeableness, again, have a, a positive relationship with all different learning styles. Neuroticism shows a much more inverse relationship as does openness. Um, um, and we will leave that there. That's pretty kind of clear. I think that's, that one's cut and dry. When it comes to leadership, um, research has shown that individuals who are considered leaders typically exhibit lower amounts of neurotic traits, higher levels of openness, and balanced levels of conscientiousness and extroversion. Um, conscientiousness really in general predicts job, job performance quite well. It's considered really one of the top ranked um, traits in, in, in mapping overall job performance. Um, again, and this one is no surprise, research has, research has demonstrated that agreeableness is negatively correlated to salary. So those high in agreeableness tend to make less on average than those that are low in the same trait. Um, and neuroticism, interestingly enough, is also negatively related to salary. Um, so it, it, it helps to smile, apparently, if you're asking for a raise. Some relationship level data, and again, this stuff is is really hairy because most of it is self-reported. I mean, as is all of this, so we just have to take it for a grain of salt. But for dating, for dating couples, self-reported relationship quality is negatively related to partner-reported neuroticism, so that the partner reporting on the other one, and it's positively related to um, conscientiousness. Um, of married couples, there's high self-reported neuroticism, extroversion, and agreeableness are related to high levels of self-reported relationship quality. Interesting. And partner-related agreeableness is related to observed relationship quality. So higher agreeableness um, and higher potential relationship quality. Political learnings. Um, so on average, those that are more liberal minded tend to be higher in openness and lower in conscientiousness. Those conser conservatives are the flip of that. So low in openness, high in conscientiousness. Um, of course, any sort of military performance um, that any more rigid thought systems um, are overwhelmingly ruled by those high in conscientiousness versus any kind of um, uh, industry that is more ruled by entrepreneurship or creativity um, is it, really the, the, the profile of an entrepreneur is really a, a really st striking contrast to that of, of someone in the military because of that conscientiousness and openness um, relationship. Um, Peterson kind of gives an interesting side note here about creativity um, that, you know, it's, it's really tough as it is for all of these traits to live in an environment where you're not um, matching up the environment with what the trait is. This calls back to Rogers, right? Creating that kind of um, those, those, those wrinkles in our consciousness or our understanding of ourself can be really perplexing. Um, and so it's really tough, especially for those high in openness, because it's tough to make money doing creative pursuits. And so Peterson offers sort of some practical advice from his clinical experience that if you're high in openness, you wanna be involved in a creative pursuit, recommending doing something to kind of stabilize your life and create stable income and pursuing that creative thing on the side. This is kind of partly due to the Pareto distribution of outcomes when it comes to creativity, that only that kind of point 0.001% of artists are the ones that get widely used. He uses the example of songs on the internet, um, that there's like eight, 80 million songs on the internet and only about a hundred of them get the kind of 300 million level views and 70 million of them never even get downloaded once. Um, so just some interesting kind of advice there. So I think that brings us to the end of my mini presentation here. Let's see if I missed anything. I think we took a really good walk through it. So what we're going to do is we'll pause here to ask some questions and have some conversation about this, um, talk about how this is all landing. Um, and then I'll tell you where we're going to go from there.
All right, wonderful. So let's let's see. I want to see where people are based on the Q and A, and then we'll figure out exactly how to how to make the most of this meetup. All right. So folks, uh, for those who are new here, we have four rules. Number one, in order to speak or ask questions, go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Number two, keep on topic. We're talking about personality traits, big five, or any other personality measurement. Um, system is is um, is fair game. Number three, be brief. There is a lot of people who have a lot of interesting things to say and ask. Please be brief. And number four, feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. All right. So with that, it's going to be Julie, Yen, David Roller, and Ping. Julie, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Um, my question is about uh, if you have a lot of people that are interested in open-mindedness, curious, um, it seems to me like you could flourish with those type of people for a long time because you always have some new interesting content. It's a quality that we're talking about, I think, when you use these traits, which makes me think that on the other hand, it's where does balance fit in? And perhaps some of these people that are maybe high in openness the other side would be their shortcomings, maybe. Um, is there a way to use these strengths of um, on the positive side and then move our improve on some of the things that were, are not naturally our acclivity? And would that be desirable? Absolutely, and I'm really happy you asked this question first because it's an important way to frame this all, is why why know this about ourselves? Like, why is this even a helpful tool or model? And it's exactly exactly that. It's really it's really based on Jungian, a Jungian kind of outlook, which is that if we understand ourselves, we are better suited to understand why we're, we're talking to ourselves and our brain in a certain way, why we're reacting in a certain way. I mean, um, Peterson says, do you know, you know, do you, is your arm any more yours than your child? No, you know, in reality, we don't really know who we are or what makes up our personality, but understand these core dimensions allows us, as you say, to interact with the world, but it is malleable. And it also allows us to under to to um, interact with others. So if we if we know someone is is low in is low in extroversion, and we're getting some some weird vibes from them, understanding, hey, this isn't personal. This isn't about me. This might not even be about the situation. This is about what this person's needs are in the moment, and their kind of key personality traits. And so Jung's kind of core functions help us to navigate relationships with others. But absolutely, I mean, I have a couple traits in myself where I've identified, you know what, you are pretty high in agreeableness that suits you well in a lot of things, but there's a lot of areas where pushing that boundary a little bit, understanding the shadow, understanding the flip side of it can actually serve as a great experiment just to keep growing and not become stagnant, but also to achieve bigger things and, and kind of step up in the world. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, and thank you, Julie. Uh, so the next one is Yen, the early one. The late one. Thank you. Uh, but how is uh, the big five personality traits uh, uh, tied to uh, biology versus, uh, you know, the nature versus nurture question? Yep, this is, you know, classic clean slate gets pulled into this a lot. Um, and I think the best answer I've heard is it's a little bit of both. Um, so there's a lot of studies that show that there might be early experiences, certainly early trauma, that might tend us toward different qualities, like being high in neuroticism. There's definitely an environmental and an exposure component to it. Um, we know Piaget would agree with that because these axioms do build on top of each other. But that being said, there's also a lot to, to show that infants come out with different levels of this kind of behavior. Um, there's the, the metaphor of kind of, um, what is it? Uh, orchid children and dandelion children, that some children are just orchids and they are just sensitive to a lot of different things. And these, these personality traits are ingrained. So the clean slate theory, you know, this, that's the classic question. There is no solid answer for it other than let's keep talking about it. Um, but uh, that's my best guess is both. Next up is David Roller. David, go ahead. So I, I really found that, um, outline that you put up very insightful and, and kind of uh, 
provided a nice visual picture. I was wondering if you could share a copy of that. Absolutely. And I have notes from all my stuff, guys. So I'll try to, um, I'll, 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 I'll do this now and then I'll try to um, pull it all together for you for next time. What I noticed as you were going down that list, is it common or typical to find yourself drifting back and forth across the two columns from time to time and depending on the situation? Because I don't see myself fitting uniquely in, in the box, but actually bouncing around from one side to the other. And, uh, you know, you may have a, 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 a comfort area that you would, you know, maybe your settled personality, but you, I can find myself drifting from one side to the other. Is that typical? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And I think there's, there's two options here. One is if we think it on, think of it on a scale from zero to 120, there's a lot of people that also fall in the middle of that scale. So, you know, your, wherever your kind of range is, it's going to be high in different places, but it is definitely a scale. And within that scale, you have the ability to move, but the likelihood of you being way over here on this thing and way over here on the other thing, if we're asking us the same question. So that example, are you, how often do you smile and are you generally pretty happy? The likelihood of you answering one of those is a 10 and one of them is a two is basically zero, but you might be a seven versus six. So you're going to, you're going to be able to vary between that scale, but you're always going to feel com more comfortable kind of dead in the middle of it. Next up is going to be Ping, Aaron, Tricia, and Joe. Ping, go ahead. Okay, I, I, I'm I, just curious, uh, since you mentioned about um, certain trades would be best um, matching with a certain type of environment, which make perfect sense. But I was wondering, this knowledge has been used uh, in the school, in the career center, in the HR department, uh, or even matchmaking. Um, I was just wondering, this is one, and also if the companies um, want to measure us according to our these scales, can we also have access to the employer's scores beforehand? Absolutely. I think that there is, um, no one likes to summarize their personality or be judged <laughs> on that basis, right? Like it, it's an uncomfortable experiment. And I think that when I, you know, what, when I hear of um, kind of older generations experience in school, there was more of a focus on understanding what are your proclivities? You know, that, that test that was like, you're going to be an astronaut, you're going to be that. We've really lost a lot of that. And I think part of that comes from the ability that anyone can be every, anyone can be anything really with, with the age of the internet. But there is, I think, of a downside of it too, is that we don't tend to learn as much about ourselves and our natural proclivities. So I think this is a, it, it is a, um, a tool that should be used, I think, especially for young people to orient themselves and understand how they want to move forward and what they really want to focus on and focus their time on. But it doesn't feel so good when someone's making you do it. And when someone's like spitting out the answer of this is who you are. Um, but so I think, you know, the only alternative here is that we take, we, we use these as tools for ourselves. We help it to understand others and kind of make those situations better. I know it's helped me understand, um, things, elements of my career and my relationships and just know myself better. Um, but they're not, you know, it's a little, it's, it's, it's tough. I would put it in the same category of, of Myers-Briggs. It helps you to really know if you're an E and the other person's an I, but it's not a perfect science and, and people don't like to be summarized into, into letters by any means. Um, as you brought up Myers-Briggs, there are a lot of people here who are familiar with Myers-Briggs and Jungian functions. How would you compare these two systems? And what, what do you, what's, what's your experience with, uh, you know, which ones do you find more useful and for what purpose? I, I want you to answer this question. My, my gut reaction is that Myers-Briggs is a little more hypey. Like it's a little bit more of a, of a Cosmo quiz or a Buzzfeed quiz where you do get to spit out these results and compare them to others. Um, I think it versus big five is pretty broad, right? You can, there are so many descriptors within these categories. I think, I think big five also has a ton more research done based on it. Um, but Shurkant, you know more about this. You tell me. Yeah. Um, I mean, the way I see it is that, uh, you know, we are 
enormously complex creatures and it is very difficult to measure us. Uh, so all these, you know, all these tests, I, you know, I use them with buckets and buckets of salt, uh, all of them. The second thing is that at the same time, having some kind of scales on which you can put yourself and compare yourself gives you a better acuity. It asks you questions about yourself and you can know yourself better as a result of using just comparing these things. So I think you get something from doing these tests in spite of their limitations. And I think the most useful thing in the test is to realize the differences in people because there is a natural tendency all of us have of just thinking that the other person is just like you. And even without thinking about it, automatically assuming that what they're saying, what they're doing is what it would be like if you were doing it or saying that. Whereas this, these, all these methods are ways of emphasizing that people are different and it allows you to deal with it. So those are kind of general comments. Um, I'm more familiar with, uh, with Jungian functions. I use the Jungian functions, the original version, not Myers-Briggs. Um, and I find them to be very useful in kind of saying, okay, what should I do? What should I do more of? Um, whereas the big five is like taking a snapshot and saying, oh, that's what I look like. Whereas I think the, with the Jungian functions, I'm able to say, okay, you know, what am I doing and what am I doing more of? So it seems to be a more active mod model to me, at least the way I, I have used it. Um, next up is going to be Aaron, Tricia, Joe, and Jairo. Aaron, go ahead. Hey, good to see everyone. Um I kind of want to push back here. I'm not a big fan of personality tests. I really don't like them all that much, especially when it comes to extroversion. And here's why. Um, at work or in certain social contexts, I'm actually an introvert. I don't really talk to people. I kind of just mind my own business. And the reason for that is because I really don't like those people. And when I don't like people, I tend to be very introverted. Uh, but when I come to 52 Living Ideas, or I'm surrounded by people who I really, really, really love talking to, I become an ultra extrovert. I can be the life of the party. I love talking and, and, and being very, 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 very social. So the reason I, I kind of have this problem with personality tests is that context matters. If you don't like the people that you're surrounded with, you're going to come off as an introvert. Or if you don't like party where they're playing like loud techno music and such, you're going to be an introvert. But then, you know, you come to a philosophy meetup or something, and now you're the life of the party. So I think context really matters. And that's why I have a lot of difficulty just using personality tests. A great example of that complexity, right? Because absolutely context is important. These are buckets and we have a lot of variation within them. Um, but even, even knowing that conclusion about extroversion to me made the model useful in some, some way because you can make that dif differentiation and, and articulate that to us in a way that we're like, yeah, totally makes sense. Excellent. Uh, next up is Tricia. Tricia, go ahead. Hi, I wanted to speak on her was saying how like how you're raised versus how you are. And so I'm familiar with the big five and I take the test all the time. And it's so interesting because I am, I feel like two opposites. Like I'm very high in openness and I'm also like very high, very low in agreeableness. And I feel like people typically <laughs> put those together and then my family raised me to be like, they, they're more on the neurotic, um, conscientious side. So they were really uncomfortable with my openness and, you know, even the disagreeableness. So it's like, they force fed me this sort of um, agreeableness and um, like people pleasing. And it just was so never me. <laughs> but it really is like skills right like you can talk to people like it's nice that people are nice and all <laughs> but it's just interesting how really before I sort of individuated from them if I were to take that test 
I would have scored really high on agreeableness because I was in fact forced to be agreeable. <laughs> but now as an adult, as like my own self in my own world, I'm able to be more authentic. So maybe how you score really does have that nature and nurture piece. <laughs> Uh, Claire, any thoughts? I mean, I, I, I think that's a great observation. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I, think I, I see it as being, you see, we are very dynamic people, uh, you know, as human beings. And I think that's one of the most important things to keep in mind, because many people make the mistake of taking a test and actually thinking that you are that. And that's actually quite destructive. Um, so, so there are two things. There is kind of, there's clear nature issues. I've seen you, you know, newborn kids who are very different. There are, I have, I have friends whose firstborn actually didn't want to have anything to do with people. They just, he just wanted to move things and run around and do things with things. Um, and the second one was trying to talk to people and smile, smile with people just when they could barely move his mouth. Um, so there are differences. At the same time, there is a nurture issue of what kind of feedback you get. Where are you, do you get smacked down when you do something which is natural to you? That has impact. And then you also have the aspect of will. You have aspect of saying, this is what I want to work on. And you can yourself work yeah. on. So those are the three things. And there is kind of combination of all of that uh, taking place. Uh, Joe, you're next. Um, hi, Claire. Um, thank you for presenting. Uh, one little problem I was going in and out during the presentation so this may have already been covered but one of the questions that I have is how valuable uh, is the five-factor model when it comes to predicting things like decision making specifically uh, is does it have any utility in that area because I know that you know what can you logically infer you know what people are going to possibly do based on their personalities and mm -hmm. that's what I'm really trying to get to is that you know, what's the real core look like? What's the predictive nature yeah. of that? Because I think that's an important part of this equation as far as, you know, when you're analyzing the validity of mm -hmm. some of these assertions, it's kind of has to work from top down, bottom up. Yep. Yeah. So I think when it comes to decision making, a couple things, it depends on the context of what the decision is. So like a, a political decision or something that really has to do with a proclivity or someone's opinion on something, as we said, those, those political outcomes might vary based on openness as well as conscientiousness. So you would see that you would actually be able to potentially predict the outcome of what that question or decision was based on the knowledge. The other thing that we know really more firmly is that just decision making in general also falls within these traits. So people that are lower in agreeableness are going to have a much easier time making decisions because it doesn't, they don't really care if they screw up or they, you know, that's their decision. They're not taking the, the pulse of the crowd with every kind of decision they make. Similarly, someone that's high in neuroticism, that those decisions are going to be a little bit tougher because of the, you know, potential all the, all the negative potentials going on in their brain. Um, so I think when it comes to what is the actual content of the decision, it's tough. It's contextual, contextualized, as Aaron pointed out. Um, but in decision making as a, as a utility itself, I think we can predict that well with this model. So next up is uh, Hiro, Jean, Dave, Paul, Jyoti, and Pegor. Hiro, go ahead. So let's say that I want to be a matchmaker and use this uh, model. And so uh, I want to match um, two people. And, and so I decide that the um, e conscientiousness, uh, the person with predominantly conscientiousness would work out better with a person with agreeableness and so on, uh, could, could that be a, a way to apply this? It's definitely a fun thing to talk about. I'll tell you that much. And I think we see this a lot with Myers-Briggs is what, what 
Myers-Briggs type equates to the other type. We certainly see it a ton in astrology, right? Like cancers go so well with Tauruses, like, okay, sure. And the truth of it is, you know, there's so much more complexity that goes on to a human relationship. But I think it, it is a fair thing to think about, or at least to help us understand our partners. And so, um, as I said in the presentation, I think there's a range here as well. You do not want to be a mirror image of your partner because there's not as much growth there. You potentially limit what what proclivity you guys might have to push or or open up new perspectives to push you in different directions. But similarly, if you have someone that is really high in extroversion and you're really low, just how you spend your time is going to be a constant strain. And so I think understanding those things just helps you navigate the relationship. But it's a fun thing to speculate. I think we would all love to be like, yes, definitely the perfect combo is this plus this equals, you know, perfect growth, but that doesn't exist. It's really speculative. Next up is Jean. Yeah, so uh, I also listened to the Jordan Peterson mentioned about, you know, when you find a partner, you don't want it to be very different in your personality. Like maybe one is too introvert, the other too extrovert. But the interesting thing I, I observed actually among all the friends who actually have partners, they're usually just the opposite. So actually I already told with some of my friends share my observation is like, if one person is extremely extrovert, they usually find an extremely introvert person to compensate. I think maybe I wonder if that's a natural selection because I don't see two very extrovert people are together at all. No couple at all, no couple in the friend of mine. So I wonder if that's kind of like, if you have the same strength in the nature environment, you won't survive. You know, you have two people with different strengths, they have better chance to survive. Another thing I've noticed, then their kids actually have more options, have different combination of personality, more diversity. So I wonder, there's some truth behind that. What, I wonder what do you think about that? Yep, natural selection is definitely an element here. Peterson would say that, you know, when you when you think about sort of the the female gender's role as the selector. This is chaos. This is, you know, this is the ju the great judge. Um what that selector is doing from an evolutionary biology perspective is it needs to select someone that is more well suited than that individual for childbearing because at that time when that that person is really exposed right? Like there is a lot of potential risk. Um, historically, when you're exposed, you're incapacitated. And so therefore you need to look for traits that are going to both balance you out and then provide some benefit. Because if you're just, as Peterson says, going to have another child there with you to create more baggage, what's the good in that? Um, so I think that I, I've seen, I've noticed that kind of balancing element too. Um, and, and it's, it, you know, some of it might be just kind of natural gender dispersion and some of it, you know, actually is kind of the magical yin-yang um, that, that creates the whole. Next up is Dave. Yeah, Claire, thanks for leading us through uh, personalities. And I wanted to get back into nature versus nurture. Uh, in a book I was reading from a psychologist that he brought two children home from the hospital. And just coming home from the hospital, he knew their personalities were completely different. And the also thing that was neat I've seen, uh, if you want to dig into it more, is the studies of twins that were separated at birth, uh, that many, many parts of their personality were so similar, but it was interesting, their mate selection of, you know, who they married was completely, completely different. So it's funny. So it, it, it very strong in some areas and, and not in others, but uh, thanks again. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next up is Paul S. Yeah, hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks. Um, personally in response, I've been, I usually am like, I think it was Jeff who's not too high on these kind of systems, but tonight I thought of something new that's kind of a counter proposition to the idea that the problem presented, which is that well, I'm like this in one environment and like this in another. So maybe, maybe a way of looking at this, and I'm curious of your thoughts on this, is one might be trying to understand what is, <clears throat> what we've talked about in past meetups as my authentic self. Like, so in the person earlier's case, uh, 
the authentic self go, is the person in the philosophy meetups maybe. And it's not that this system is wrong, it's that they're not able to express their authentic self at work. So that's a way of saying, no, it doesn't propose that this whole system is wrong because you're one way in one environment and one way in another. So that's my thought. Thank you, Paul. Um, Jyoti, you're next. Yeah. Uh, people who hop into different cultures, they demonstrate a diff same trait differently in two cultures, just for the sake of adaptation. What do you have to say about that? Yes, so the cultural dis dispersion is a big um, conversation when it comes to Big Five. There's some research done on it. Definitely there's certain cultures that tend toward certain traits, um, but I I'm, I'm don't have enough information to speak on that with authority. Next up is Pegor. Hey, so I just wanted to sort of relate uh, because I've, I've been hearing a lot of questions about how does Big Five sort of relate to the real world, so to speak, or how can we make them? So I just want to sort of try to address that question. First of all, the Big Five is like the test that I took, which is from Peterson's website. It's a percentage thing. So you're like 50 above the 50th percentile. So it's like in probability, if you say someone has a 80% chance of winning, that means they still have a 20% chance of losing. So if you're like the 80th percentile in extroversion, that, that means that there's still gonna be some times where you're gonna behave in an introverted manner. That's first, so just because you're high doesn't mean you're, you have to behave in that temperament all the time. And the second thing sort of to, to tie in like more concretely, for example, uh, so, someone asked about relationships. So let's say you're in a relationship with someone and you know that you're more agreeable, that you're high in agreeable and they're fairly low in agreeableness. What that allows you to do is that that allows you to to speak with the other person and tell them that, listen, I'm high in agreeableness, you're low in agreeableness. So that means that if we don't check ourselves, you're most likely going to impose stuff on me and I'm not going to resist. And that's going to make things go bad. And so yeah. we can, if we keep check of this situation, we can address it. Or let's say maybe someone is, uh, let's say your partner is higher in orderliness than you are, they're going to end up cleaning the house more often than you are because you're not going to be upset that things are a bit messy as often as your partner is. And so they're going to maybe feel that, oh, I do all the cleaning and my partner doesn't. But if you know this about yourself via the big five, you can negotiate. You know, maybe your partner said, it's okay, I'll clean all the time, but you do the cooking, for example, and you can set up a negotiation. In, uh, for example, yeah, go ahead. Claire. No, 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 please finish. For example, with with jobs, let's say you're uh, you're you're low in extroversion, uh, then perhaps you should think twice before you take a job in sales. Now, Peterson points out that you can train yourself the skills that an extroverted person has, and you can use that to to uh, to fulfill a sales position, let's say, very well. But it's still gonna be that sort of psychological drain for you at the end of the day. So perhaps it's just better that you find a job that's that doesn't require you to interact with people so that you, you just it's a better fit for you so and and regarding again sort of to loop back the relationships peterson says that maybe it's not that good of an idea to find someone who exactly matches your personality because then there's it's just like you're dating yourself right. and there's no variability and so ideally there should be some vi variability he says that we don't know the, how much variability is preferred i would have loved if we could have done some kind of exper uh, not necessarily like data collection on couples who've been married for like 30, 40 years and do their personality comparisons and see what's the range difference between each trait and maybe get an idea. Uh, so yeah, just what I, what I think personally Big Five has done big for me is it just lets me know where my strengths and weaknesses are, so to speak, and, and allows me to sort of keep myself in check regarding that. And thank you, Claire, for your presentation. Thank you for being here, Fikor. I, I think you're you're hitting it on the on the head here, which is that there's a blindness when we don't know these traits to how other people feel. And so I think Trisha kind of alluded to this before with your family is because it dictates your value structure, you literally value those other things less. And you think that everyone else does too, right? So it creates this total blind spot where it, like cleanliness is the perfect example is you don't even see that thing as dirty 
And so, so the the thing that, that it got cleaned is just a non-issue because it doesn't even process in your value hierarchy. Um, the one that Roger used as an example for me that blew my mind was agreeableness and relationships. And that for the for the person that's lower in agreeableness, they see the world as a 50-50 match that you're gonna give 50%, the other person is gonna always gonna meet you, is gonna see and meet you at that 50%. And that's how it's gonna work. For those that are lower in agreeableness, they think that you're going to do the best you can. I'm going to do the best you can, I can, and, and we're going to make up the difference. You're going to tell me about the difference and we'll figure that out. And so it's just these two different almost worldviews. And when someone doesn't have the kind of just understanding to see that someone's worldview exists on a map that is different than their own, it just makes those conversations all the more difficult to, to navigate. And so being able to call it in a relationship and say, hey, is there something you want to talk about or, or, or you know, opening up the door to feel, see the other side of the spectrum is really valuable. Okay, Claire. So what I would like to do is that I think the familiarity that people have here is not very high. It's kind of medium to low. So here's what I was proposing to do. Uh, instead of the test, because the test will be too onerous uh, for people. Um, I think one of the crucial things that we have to do is that we have to have kind of a self-assessment too, because no matter what the test says, you have to have your own assessment. So we can do that. What I'm proposing to do is to go through each trait. Now focus on each trait, like openness. You put, the, put, the, um, put your um, description of it up talk through it and we'll ask everybody the question, do you think you are high, medium or low in openness? And then we will discuss openness itself. So one by one, let's discuss all the five, deal with all the questions and comments uh, at that level and then go for the, ne for the next one. Pegor, you had something to say about this? Yeah, and just like a quick thing, because I guess a lot of people are gonna do it. If you're gonna take the big five test, and this is a recommendation from Peterson, Make sure that you've eaten before. You're not upset. You're not like you're you're emotionally sort of as neutral as can be because that can throw off your test results. Just like a quick tip, because I'm guessing a lot of people are gonna do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So let's let's go one, one by one. Are you sure we don't want to take the test? You want to take that? Okay. Let, let's let's do one thing. Um, let's do a oh. poll. Let's do a poll. Uh, folks, uh, if you want to take the test, uh, see one uh, test is about 15 minutes. Um, so I, if you want to take the test, uh, that will take about 15 minutes. You'll have to spend, you will, uh, <laughs> 15 minutes, you'll get the result. Uh, use either the participant panel uh, and say yes or no. Um, or you can say yes or no in the chat. Ready. Okay, so there are 46 people in there. So just uh, let us know yes or no. Um, and then we'll make a decision based on that. Okay, uh, we got only two, okay, two, one, two, three, four, six, 10, 11, okay, 11, okay. Well, I think the number is too small. I agree. Only like yeah, I saw some head shaking too, and I think people have already taken it. So yeah. I'll okay. bow down on this one. Okay, let's let's do that. Okay, so let's um, let's talk about these. Uh, let's talk about openness. So, Great. Um, so the topic now is openness. Um, you can, if you know. So the question is: Are you high on openness, medium or low? So you can type in either high, medium, or low in uh, in chat. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Claire, if you could bring up the description of openness and talk to it. Um, um, is it better for you guys if I just share my screen? Probably. Yes. Yes. That's okay. Great. So being high in um, openness, again, this is the creative dimension. So you are more curious. You are more imaginative. You're very relatable. You live in a world of ideas or aesthetics. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, looks like you're open to trying new things. You're more unconventional. You probably tend to go to meetups. Hint, hint. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I think almost, uh, and this is something that I have found for our meetups. 
um, that it's almost universally kind of high uh, in openness because only the people who are trying to say, okay, what else is out there? What can I learn? Uh, having the curiosity of coming saying, well, you know, what will I find? What is, what is Claire going to talk about today? So that I think the openness uh, is, um, I think, fundamental characteristic of people who show up over here. So if anybody has any comments or questions about openness, you can go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Does anybody have any comments about openness? Okay, uh, Aaron, about openness. Yeah, just real quick. I, I'm like, well, what if you don't trust certain people? You know, like I'm not gonna just uh, give my life story to people who I, I don't really trust or I, I'm afraid they're gonna use that against me. So I, I could be kind of closed-minded in those situations. Okay. So I would say, remember, it's not closed. It's low in openness. And I would say that that's true. I think that trust is, is an indicator of high openness here. And so that puts you lower down on the spectrum. Okay, um, very good. Um, all right, so no more questions about openness. Uh, let's go to conscientiousness. Wait, 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 wait. Barry, you had something to say? Yes, Can, um, am I on speaker? Yes, go ahead. Okay, openness has caused me more problems in life than I can imagine. My parents didn't like me to be open. I was too, and they didn't like me being an introvert, okay? They wanted me to be more sociable, even though I was a straight A student in high school. They complained about it. My children don't like my creativity that I have, I have, uh, especially been when, since my wife died in 2014 and I started painting and writing poetry and making presentations and, and, uh, and my children react to this negatively. And uh, so um, I think we're punished in our culture, especially with our families for being too open. That's been my experience. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very good observation. Um, I think there is also, um, you know, I mean, for example, I grew up in India and there also it's a question of saying, okay, decide what you want to do and just do that. Don't look at anything else. So the idea of kind of trying to explore more things is considered to be kind of waste of time of saying, okay, let's, let's you know, just focus and, and do it. So absolutely. Um, all right, uh, let's go to conscientiousness. Uh, so on conscientiousness, are you high on consciousness, medium or low? Uh, Claire, could you go ahead and type, uh, you know, read out what conscientiousness means? Absolutely. So those high in conscientiousness, these are our military folks. These are people that like rules. They are high in competence. They prepare for things. They are schedule oriented. They are organized. They have a actual disgust factor associated with disorderliness. They're achievement striving. They're self-disciplined. Um, there's a lot of sort of deliberation and a more analytical fo focus assorted here. Um, in contrast, those low in, in conscientiousness are more disorganized, careless, they don't like structure, um, they, they um, procrastinate, they're more indis undisciplined, potentially more impulsive. Excellent, uh, excellent. So now if anybody has any comments about conscientiousness um, or questions about conscientiousness, this is the time for, for the conscientious uh, questions. Uh, so it's going to be uh, Stephen followed by Jyoti. Stephen, go ahead. Okay, so uh, thank you. Gosh, Claire, what a great presentation. You always do so well. Uh, the, um, like, I love organization, uh, and yet I uh, am always procrastinating. You know, I'm, so I'm busy organizing, and uh, I don't, I'm conscientious, but I'm disorganized. What do you think? Do you, um, how do you tend in when it comes to negative emotion in general? So are you generally anxious about other things? Nah. 
No. Okay. So interesting. So, cause, cause what I would say is potentially there's a neuroticism overwhelming the conscientiousness there. Um, but one trick I've really learned from Kahneman system one and system two is to let the different sides of your brain kind of navigate that procrastination. And so often what happens when you're procrastinating is that you have a, a kind of a spew of productivity, or you can kind of let the more animalistic part of your brain just like go and then boom, the analytical element element of your consciousness slams down like a hammer and is really going to start to judge you. And so allowing those different parts of your psyche to actually talk to each other, giving them the space to exist for me has kind of helped to kind of navigate that um, procrastination. So being, being high in procrastination, definitely, I would say would low to being good, would tend to toward being low in conscientiousness. Um, but Hey, it's not like just because you have a proclivity toward this thing that it's going to be really, really easy for you necessarily. Okay. Next up is going to be Jeff. I'm going to give uh, precedence to people who have not spoken before. So it's going to be Jeff, sure. Jeff yep. Jyoti, Ping, and Pegot. Jeff, go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, this, the, this, um, <laughs> I'm going to use the Myers Briggs letters because it just comes to me faster, though. But the the, the openness, which is which is N, in in Myers, and uh, and the conscientiousness, which is which is uh, J, right? <laughs> I, I think I think that was going to be my other question. But I just I feel like if you are if you are N, if you are intuitive, if you, if you are uh, uh, open, um, it's, the logic sounds funny when I say it. What 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 the uh, the, the, the big five. Um, it seems like that's sort of, it's really hard to be completely uh, uh, non-conscientious. I think there's some amount of conscientiousness that comes with being open. Uh, and, and I'm just thinking out loud here, this is not trying to answer my own question, but, but just like, it's almost like if you were, if you're totally open to everything, then, then that's what just invite a lot of chaos. So it's almost like that openness is a luxury that you get when you have a certain amount of order in your world. Absolutely. I'm glad I'm glad you brought this up. I think that there you also need a certain amount of sort of your feet under you. So if you are struggling to kind of eat and maintain just your your living situation, the proclivity toward art and aesthetic endeavors is much lower. Um, similarly, Peterson points out that there's sort of an evolutionary purpose to conscientiousness. So it's hard to figure out, okay, why, why is dutifulness actually important? But it's possible that, you know, industrious people find unindustrious people quite unsettling. Um, and so human beings kind of in throughout human history, we've always been, been, been involved in what, what he refers to as a labor exchange. And so certainly there were plenty of people who were unproductive, but potentially they were wiped out by people who were unhappy with that productivity. Um, because, you know, people who are conscientious, they feel bad when they're not working all the time. They're always going like mad. Um, and so again, potentially there's, there's potential that those lower in conscientiousness have just kind of evolved out. Excellent. Uh, next up is uh, William followed by Judith. William, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'd like to just talk about uh, low conscientious people a little bit. And I think all is not lost is these are people that just need a structured environment like the military. So the military isn't all very conscientious people. They're filled with people who have low conscientiousness but need that structure in order to thrive. And I think the same thing was with openness. You know, you can get a job that forces you to be more open. And so I guess my, my point is all is not lost if you score low on one of these traits. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think for a long time, I was actually proud of my low conscientiousness because I thought, and Aaron and I were talking about this, I thought that being overly rigid and scheduled kept you from these serendipitous magical experiences that come from being unplanned. And I think that what I was doing there is I was correlating openness and conscientiousness in a way that they don't necessarily have to be correlated. And so I found a lot of relief in actually scheduling my life, creating more rigid morning routines, but allowing for pockets of high openness and exposure to chaos. And Shurkant does this so well that you'll see him one week and he's like, I'm taking salsa class. 
classes or I'm doing this, like really open up yourself in certain pockets toward the proclivity toward just chaos and really just not, you know, craziness, but do it in a way where you're going to allow your conscious conscientiousness to also aim at something because that's going to really set you up for success in, in the kind of more societal structures that we live. So uh, next up is uh, Judith. Okay, well, that's exactly what I need to do, Claire. And, and William, I would not want to be in the military. I don't want my low uh, conscientiousness to be taken care of in that way. But <laughs> I, I want to add that, um, well, I mean, in the military or anything else, I just would not want a regimented structured um, life to cure my conscientious issue. However, I do have a wish to have things more um, structured. Um, I think I would feel better like what Claire was saying. So I'm actually trying to do that. But interestingly, um, at my work, I'm very uh, conscientious mm -hmm. and, um, and I have to be, and I want to be, and I'm probably more so than anyone, but my desk wouldn't look like that. Um, although I would want it to look like that. Um, so I just find it interesting that um, like in certain areas, I'm even in my home life, I'm more um, conscientious than most. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm pretty sure I fall on the low conscientiousness because I, I like to, um, I guess it's my openness, you know, like I just, it gets in the way. So like, I'm like, that's not important right now. So doing this interesting spontaneous thing is more interesting right now. And then I lose the structure that I need. Absolutely. And I think um, you're right that in different realms and different environments, we might r range differently on this spectrum. I might also take a hunch here, at least I can only speak for myself, that um, my conscientiousness is also sometimes wrapped up in my agreeableness, that I am so oriented toward others and the well-being of others that I'm not sort of conscientious enough to take care of this, the rigidness in the place that I need it, which is like, routine exercise, taking care of myself. And so I am more have a proclivity to like, yeah, get my work done, make sure everyone else is like way ahead of schedule. But when it comes to like my personal statement and essay, forget it. It's just too, it's too personal. Excellent. Uh, I want to second point, uh, second the point that uh, William was making that it's not just you in isolation. You have to look at the system around you and right. you don't have to be everything at the same time but you kind of need various things. And if you can work out a system where, you know, the other, other people can provide that in exchange for what you provide them, I think it, it works uh, really well uh, as well. So it's gonna be Jyoti, Peng, Pegor, and Jean next. Jyoti, go ahead. Yeah, Clara, I'm, I'm a highly conscientious person. I meet all the characteristics of what you had described here of a conscientious person. What is the difference between me and a very highly anxious person? Because I think I'm also doing all those things in my life because I'm anxious all the time to, to keep it straight, keep it right. So uh, then I, then this is not the trait that I have, you have that in a conscientious person. You have, I'm neurotic in other words. Yes. So <laughs> neurotic, I would say is the term in all of this that gets caught up in the most baggage. So don't think of the word neurotic, like just put that out of our mind because that is a really a loaded word. But when it comes to those anxious emotions, you know, it, it's negative emotion is really how, the way to think about it. So I would say that you're both high in conscientiousness and high in neuroticism, which allows you, I mean, when you talk about wanting to get things done and kind of have the fear of God in you, that is a lethal combination. Um, and so just, again, just knowing these things, checking them, I think with neuroticism, we'll, we'll get into it, but there's a lot of negative self-talk that you just have to listen to almost in a meditative state, see it happening, watch it go by, don't judge yourself from having it, but let it pass because it doesn't really reflect the reality. Next up is Ping. Ping, go ahead. Okay, um, I, I two th little things. One is, um, is it possible to have both high and low in the consciousness? It is not. 
So, um, so again, just think about every adjective that could ever go around with conscientiousness. So clean, organized, all of those words. So you are, you, you might have a, a, a scale where you can be up to this or that you could also be flat in the middle of it. So you could just be like half, half high in conscientiousness, half not. And I think that that's what we get sometimes when we see people that, that you have a, something that you're kind of stuck on, um, is maybe you just fall, you know, you're not just not, we have some traits where we're way high, just totally outlier. We have some where we're more, more flatly in the, in the middle. Well, um, because I, I will tell you, um, for example, that I love challenges. I, if things are, are, are difficult, I, I, I become super conscientious. But if things are easy, I kind of become this procrastinator because I want to make it, I want to increase the difficulty uh, rating of that task by pushing it to the limit of the impossible date or time left. Um, then, then I get my attention and uh, my, my, you know, then I want to accomplish that. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's difficult for me to grade this one. Um, and also the second point, I know there are a lot of, you have a lot more to go, so I will go quickly. And the second one is, I also noticed that you correlate um, among different trades. For example, you mentioned about uh, openness usually is in conflict, I mean, in opposite relation with uh, um, neuroticism, but it also openness have some kind of relationship with conscientiousness. So I, I think it's really interesting because it make it more uh, dynamic and make it more, um, yeah, it's just they, they are, they are in influencing each other in a way that make our personality more complex. And, and I would say that they're not influencing each other, but they both exist in you uniquely. And so that is influencing you in other ways. And so I would hypothesize potentially that what you perceive as low conscientiousness when it comes to really wanting like an intense high that might that, you know, and, and really wanting to, to push it and, and, and keep keep the kind of energy up, I almost might see that as, as, as the reaction to a high level of openness, that because of that creative spirit, because you're always wanting to kind of push things and live in a realm of ideas, um, you know, you're, you aren't happy just being in a box and getting the box checked, you want a little bit more. And so I, I think these things don't relate to each other, but when we embody all of them and we implement them in our lives, absolutely, they, they're crossing all over the place. Okay, uh, so it's going to be uh, Pegor, Jean, and Paul, and then we will go to the next uh, next uh, axis, which is uh, extroversion. So Pegor, go ahead. Okay, so off of like the last point, first of all, like yeah, be mindful that how your different temperaments interplay with each other. The other thing that I would like to point out is if you if you feel like you don't fully fit into one person, let's say you're high in conscientiousness, but there are some things that you do that are contradictory to that. Uh, it's maybe beneficial to look because each of these big five is split into two sub categories. And for example, with me, I'm average on conscientiousness. And the reason why that is, is because I am low in industriousness and very high and high in orderliness. And what that is, is that, and I think this is this sort of points to Stephen in the beginning, industriousness is more like self-discipline and like working hard, whereas orderliness is more like organization and, and uh, being uh, tidy. So you could so you could be sort of up in conscientiousness because you're really high in orderliness, but then low in uh, in industriousness, and so that could be like the reason why you're thinking, I don't really fit in in one. That the result is off in some sense. I'm so glad you said this. There's different dimensions within each of them. We will give you guys the quiz to take this afterwards. And what it does is it gives you a score for conscientiousness, but it does break down these subcategories within them. Um, so at, I'm so glad you said that, Pegor, because absolutely neuroticism, um, agreeableness, you might have higher compassion levels, but you're not, not, you know, not too worried with being polite. Excellent. Uh, and thanks, uh, Pegor. I think that's, that's a great thing. And going forward, what we'll do is that whenever we talk about each of them, like extroversion, we'll talk about both those things uh, together. Okay, next up is uh, Jean. Jean, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I'm very low in conscientiousness. So I don't quite agree. Somebody uh, mentioned about going to the soldier, like the military. I think that will be the place I will die, I think. But certain type of structure, I think what Claire mentioned, 
you know, have some type of structure, especially when I work for myself, I have to do a structure because otherwise, you know, I like the flexibility to being self-employed. At the same time, I realize nobody supervises you, you have to set your own structure. At the same time, you have space for flexibility. Um, so I, I think, you know, you have to work with your personality, but also give maybe the structure to other people is not enough, but to you, it's just perfect. Thank you. Yeah, excellent point, Jean. Uh, I, again, that, that's also a key thing of saying, sometimes you need just 5% of structure and that is going to actually increase the results dramatically because that's exactly what you need. Uh, next, uh, next up is Paul. Yeah, thanks. I want to um, revisit Jyothi's point because I'm not sure we quite got there because I had a similar question, which is if somebody was being very conscientious because of being high on the neuroticism scale um, and using the word as this uses it and she described anxiety, it implies much less stability like and that it's more like well, that means that, for instance, therapy would lower the anxiety and suddenly that person wouldn't be high on conscientiousness because they'd stop trying to be all those things that was driven by their anxiety. So comments on that. Uh, so what, what I would say is that you would have to say, for, for example, conscientiousness. I, again, like the idea of breaking these up into two things. So let's see orderliness and industriousness. So suppose... Only when you are anxious, you are industrious or orderly. Then it's mostly in anxiousness that you're talking about. If it stops, you know, if, if you're not anxious about something, then you get disorderly and you're not industrious, then it's not a conscientious tra trait. So you're really, the core trait is uh, anxious, uh, you know, kind of uh, low on neuroticism. Neuroticism also, I don't like the term. I think more in terms of kind of calm versus not calm. Uh, so calm, I think, kind of captures that issue better for me. Um, all right, let's go to the next one, which is extroversion. What is extroversion? And uh, folks, you can go ahead and start typing whether you are high in extroversion, uh, medium, or low in extroversion. And so the, thank you. Those high in extroversion, they enjoy being the center of attention. They like to start new conversations. They enjoy meeting new people. They have a wider social circle. They find it easy to make new friends. They feel energized when they're around other people. And this is really the key differentiator is where do you get your energy? Does being alone help you kind of power up so you're ready to greet the world? Or does being with others energize you so you're ready to greet the world? Like they're, those are really in contrast to each other. Um, they often also say things before they think about them. In contrast, in introverts prefer solitude. They feel exhausted when they when they have to socialize a lot, or at least they need to take a break, right? Being with a large group is gonna take the wind out of them in a certain way. Um, they find it difficult to start conversations. They don't like small talk. They carefully think things through before speaking. They don't love to be the center of attention or really exist in a, in a, in a large group at all. So how does this break down um, into enthusiasm and assertiveness. So enthusiasm being gregariousness, positive emotions, warmth, assertiveness is all of that sort of excitement seeding activity, assertiveness um, kind of bumbling up into extroversion as a whole. Again, careful not to use introversion. Um, so when we use introversion or extroversion, we're talking about Myers-Briggs. When we talk about extroversion on a sliding scale, we're talking big five. Okay, excellent, uh, excellent. I just have to tell tell a story here. Um, I've been running, uh, you know, I used to run when, when I discovered uh, Myers-Briggs and um, uh, Jung's cognitive functions. I always like to do meetups. So I started doing meetups on a large scale with uh, folks. I would get about 80 people and I would divide them into different groups and ask them to work on different things, try to figure out how different people deal with everything. And once I made the mistake of saying, Okay, all the extroverts on one side and all the introverts on other side. Oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. That's the worst experiment because introverts sat there not knowing what to say. They didn't want to talk. They, you know, they, were, they were all bored. And extroverts complained very loudly that nobody wanted to listen to them. So uh, just to the side. Um, all right, so it's going to be Maritza next. Maritza, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um you know, of, of the five uh, personality traits, 
extra version is one of the ones that I found to be most odd in this model. The um, putting together of as assertion with um, enthusiasm was very strange to me. And um, so for example, I, I scored like extremely high in assertiveness. I'm 98th percentile, but I'm very, very low in, um, in not very, very, but I'm, I'm low for enthusiasm, but I still scored extremely high in extroversion. And I, I, I found the, the descriptor to not quite seem to be correct. Um, I, I would be interested in hearing somebody's thoughts on how or why they, they see that assertiveness and enthusiasm go hand in hand. This is also the toughest one for me. I think that it, it, this is the hardest one for me to kind of wrap my mind around. And I see enthusiasm also in contrast to neuroticism. Um, so I don't know. Peanut gallery? Uh, okay. Uh, I, will, I, I, will, I will volunteer from the peanut gallery. Uh, so uh, one thing I would say is uh, absolutely. I think that's a gr great observation. I think that's true for me on many of these things. Um, so, for example, on um, conscientiousness, I'm very high in industriousness, but I'm quite low in orderliness. Um, so industriousness, I'm just through the roof and orderliness, I'm lower. Um, and so I definitely, I, I would rather look at those 10 mm -hmm. divisions. I, don't, I found them to be far more useful, for example, in agreeableness too, compassion versus politeness. Uh, that varies quite a bit. You know, people vary quite a bit on that. Um, on the volatility and withdrawal for uh, neuroticism, also those, uh, you know, people can vary quite a bit. Uh, the intellect versus aesthetic openness, that also people vary quite a bit. So I think it's much better to look at tests in those 10, um, you know, those 10 um, measures rather than the five measures. I think it tells you more about yourself. Uh, so I, you know, so that, that's, that's what I would say. Anybody, uh, any other thoughts on uh, extroversion? Extraversion? Okay, we'll go to the next one then. Uh, agreeable, if, if you're agreeable, go ahead. Great, so those high in, in agreeableness have high interest in other people. So they interpret the world based on relationships and people. They have are higher in trust, they're more straightforward, there's a an, an emphasis toward altruism and charity, they're higher in compliance, higher in modesty, more sympathetic, high level of empathy, and again, they're putting each of others before themselves. They see the world as this 50-50 kind of relationship. Those lower in agreeables are going to be more skeptical, demanding, stubborn, potentially show-offs, unsympathetic, don't care as much about how other people feel, more confrontational, et cetera. Um, and let's see what this breaks down to. Um, so agreeableness breaks into compassion, where we see qualities like tender-mindedness, altruism, and trust versus politeness. So this is just your kind of niceties, which breaks down into compliance, modesty, and straightforwardness. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on agreeableness? Aaron, go ahead. Sorry, I'm being Mr. Monkey Wrench here, and, and <laughs> but um, disagreeable, right? Yeah, I'm being disagreeable today, right? I'm I'm bad. Um, but here's the deal with this. I I do think that our level of agreeableness does go up when we're trying to really impress somebody. Um, just think of a guy. He's on a first date with a girl. He might be a lot more agreeable and, and just trying to impress that person, whereas when he's talking with his younger brother, he might be more disagreeable. So I, I think that if there's a power dynamic, then that's going to affect how agreeable you are in, in certain situations. Yeah, I mean, um, Aaron, I mean, you, you made this point in three different things, and I agree that there is a variation, but there is a pattern to the variation. So for example, like your first example, uh, extrovert versus introvert, what happens is that most extrovert people 
in most situations, they find a way of interacting with people. Uh, in case of introvert, if they are with people they like, they are they are very very you know uh, they they are very outgoing in that context. But it's only within kind of limited. So it's it's the extent. So it's not just whether the person does this or not, but the general pattern, uh, whether they have a propensity to do that. So that's the thing that is uh, that you're trying to measure within with variations in context. Does th does that make sense? Yeah, you know, I, I hear you guys. It's just, I, I guess I'm just very situational. Sure, sure. There is definitely situational variation. And what you're trying, all these measures are trying to kind of collate all the situations and try to see if there is a difference in patterns between the differences in situation. That's what you're, you know, okay. Um, all right, so next one is going to be Christian. Christian, go ahead. Hi. Um, this one in specific actually uh, captures my attention because I've been listening to Jordan Peterson's lectures on, and this one resonates with me because, um, well, first of all, you, you're comparing or you're putting two extremes in there. One is compassion and the other one is politeness. I don't know, but I would say that uh, in contrast to compassion, I would put selfishness a little bit more than politeness. Mm -hmm. But also, I remember that Jor Jordan says that the people are, that are less agreeable are actually uh, more successful uh, today. That um, repetitive times in his lectures, he's always constantly saying this also relating to um, many other factors about gender identity and stuff. But for me, I have, a, I have given it a lot of thought because a, a person, I imagine a person that it's a leader cannot entirely be disagreeable um, if he wants to cooperate or at least get a team to cooperate, right? And certainly the most successful people in the world, I guess, they're leaders like CEOs, if we're talking about success, about money and companies, et cetera. So I don't know, for me, I, I still think that being completely disagreeable is definitely not the right path. Um, also completely, completely agreeable is definitely not, but um, I'm just having a little trouble understanding what's the right level, right? I don't know what you guys think about this. And I think there's a there's a moral component here as well, because I think what Peterson would say is if you are so agreeable that you've never, ever once been disagreeable or been low in agreeableness, you haven't proven to yourself or the world that you can stand up against against anything unethical. And so I think this is one that this is my number one that I'm working day and night to try to be less agreeable. It's really tough. I'd, I'm happy to talk to some tools that I've used. Um, but I think that at least showing that boundary is important. I found in leadership, um, some teams react really well to a disagreeable leader. I think in the military, this is true, right? Like I find this a lot in sales teams where they need a raw, raw, go get them, like no nonsense approach. But that's really needs to be an individualized experience based on who's on the team and who you need to inspire. But one thing I will say is if, if you're a leader and your community knows that they can push you all the way and you will, you don't have a line that it just won't work. It just, you know, flat out doesn't work. I know in my experience, my favorite tutors, my favorite teachers were those that, that were strict, you know, that, 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 that made me really stand up for myself. Um, so I think that, yes, if you want to raise, it really helps you to, to be low in agreeableness because that, that squeaky wheel really does get the grease. All right, folks. So again, I'm giving priority, priority to people who have not spoken much before. So it's going to be Kevin, David, R, and Julie next. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, it's just a follow up uh, agreeable. I would say agreeable is nothing wrong. I would say not a, totally agree something, get a point or certain point. Even not agree with the positive he expressed, but I listen to it and learn something from a dis different perspective. I always learn something. It's uh, even my boss. Let's say, agree with do his job, do it. 
but it's something you know when you do it possibly even get a better way to do it you still learn something that's attitude obviously Absolutely. thank you uh next up is uh david david go ahead uh, going back to what aaron said i i think i have to kind of favor his his um feelings there i think you're you change based on your situations and sometimes you adapt. Uh, and, and I've actually been able to see this in other people's personalities has when they're in one situation or setting, they behave in this way and they take the same person and bring them into a different context. And there's significant changes and ad ad adaptations. So I, I do think, and I even see that in myself, um, that I can migrate from one side to the other side, depending upon, I guess you could say, the feeling or how you're reading the, the, the situation you're in and what would be appropriate and what would, would be needed. Um, and driving this is specifically to agreeableness. I mean, I've been in settings where you start to see the group think occurring. And then I'll, um, I will find myself going in and becoming the devil's advocate and becoming unagreeable to try to push the situation a little bit in the other direction so that we don't lose a perspective of not taking, you know, looking at the whole thing. So I could find myself actually adapting, if you will, or modifying my base premise so that I can maybe increase or, or benefit the, the context of the situation that I might be in. This is a very important nuance because I think Peterson's perspective on this would, would, would take a pretty hard stance that that change actually signifies a lack of integration rather than anything else. And he would really encourage us, if possible, to live in truth insofar that we exist pretty consistently, no matter who we're speaking to. This is something I totally struggle with, where I have groups of friends who are all over the place, and I would never bring them together. And I behave really differently around them. But I think, you know, Rogers would also agree that that, that might mark a lack of, of ironing out of the folds and a potentially sins of omission when you're having conversations and you know you're not necessarily mapping up with 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 who you really are just um, a there. yeah I, I would also like to add one thing i i think the situational thing is very important okay it's very important it's critical because we it's not we don't op, you know operate in vacuum and the context that we are in we are addressing, you know, we need to address the context. The strengths in that context are going to be such or weaknesses in that context are going to be such that the way in which we act, we, you know, what functions, I always think in the Jungian function, what functions we use is going to change. We have the capacity of moving on these scales somewhat. Um, so I'm completely, on board of, you know, I fully understand that you have to act differently in different situations. But what, the, what they're trying to measure is something else. What they're trying to say, okay, if you average out over all the situations, is, does some pattern emerge? And that's what you're trying to measure through all these, all these methods. So it doesn't uh, negate the fact that there are different situations and you act differently in different situations. Um, so th that's, you know, it's, it's a you know, great point that, um, that both Aaron and David brought up, but that's, that's how I think. I, I don't think it uh, negates what is being done, but it is an important uh, kind of way in which you apply it. Um, next up is going to be Warpen, Julie, and Paul. Uh, Wartan, go ahead. Uh, Bertan, if you're there, you need to unmute yourself. All right, uh, Julie, you're next. Um, yeah, I was wondering if there's any, if they've done any correlations with the qualities of like 
ability to take responsibility for things or where blaming personalities come in, rigid or judgmental personalities would come in to this model? I would put that in agreeableness as well. Um, at, you know, the ability to kind of deflect and not internalize, but I think there's there's different elements there. I'm not exactly sure. Okay, uh, Bertrand, you're next. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, okay. Thank you both for this presentation. So we've heard the different descriptions today, a uh, snapshot of uh, your traits or temperament. And a word I'll throw out there is habits. Um, and then we've talked about how they vary in contexts and with people and situations. Uh, we, we also said that they range and you can move up a scale uh, or, or down in, in various dimensions. Um, so I would say, well, if they are interweaving like neuroticism and conscientiousness together, uh, maybe perhaps you have a, an event happen that causes you neuroticism to and motivates you to become more conscientious. And then you now moved up in your conscientiousness and you've sort of become different personality. You drop the neuroticism and as it no longer necessarily serves you and you've, you've decoupled them and you've, you've sort of changed the snapshot uh, at a later time. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, great comment. Uh, next up is going to be Brian followed by Paulus. Brian, go ahead. Hey, I'm just wondering if they have been able to establish correlations at all. Um, it makes me think of the dark triad, uh, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and I can't remember the other, but if you have one, you're likely to have the others. Just wondering if there's any work on that. Uh, you're on mute. Claire. I'm sure there is. Um, the other test that makes me think of is the F scale, which is which is a scale that they use to, to mark someone's proclivity toward fascism and kind of tendency toward genocide. Um, but I don't know of any of that research particularly, so I'll have to look into it. Okay, next up is Paul S. Paul. Thanks. Uh, great job, Shrikant and Claire, as always. Um, I'm, I wonder if anyone else has this gut reaction that I have that, that all of these traits were, are still with us because they are and were evolutionarily advantageous. And there's this huge value judgment in this whole system where there's implication that one side has good stuff and the other side has bad stuff. And I can't stand it. And, uh, and I want to see something more like the genders, masculine and feminine. We all have both in us. We may have, a, and they're both hugely valuable, but these words don't say that to me. So I wonder if anyone else is feeling that problem. I think absolutely. And I think the genders is a great way to, to frame it. I think what we, we strike here is the environment in which we live. So if we take a snapshot of just what's going on right here on a, on a, on a, in the world, it just tends towards certain traits, just makes it a little bit easier to survive in it. Similarly, how you orient yourself based on what you're trying to achieve that might be the only way to really look at this as a, as a judgment, right? So if you're trying to achieve some sort of, or aiming towards something, and one of your traits, you know, might not help you do that, maybe thinking of that negatively, but otherwise, absolutely, yes, there is no judgment in this. And I think that's why neuroticism really isn't the right word, because it's so loaded. But all of these things are meant to be just the beautiful aspects of you. And without all the di diversity, we don't get kind of the cool element of humanity. And I think that that's something that we, we get wrong with the gender breakdown is we kind of just value one as the top of the hierarchy without understanding the potential benefit of the difference. Excellent. So now it's going to be Maritza, Ping, and Pegor, and then we will go to neuroticism. Maritza, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to point out, so I, I did take 
the this test on um, Jordan Peterson's website, the um, the understandmyself.com. And I what what stood out to me for the agreeableness was so just full disclosure, I am the opposite of you, Claire. I am super, super low on the agreeableness scale. I'm three percent. Um, which was not actually a surprise to me because I I have many things, but I'm not really a nice person. I'm not a mean person, but I'm not a nice person. But what, in keeping with what the gentleman who just spoke before me, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, stated, I saw something here that I thought was really important to pull out. The first sentence in the descriptor for me says, People with exceptionally low levels of agreeableness are seen by others as, and I'm not even going to continue because that's the part to me there that is mm -hmm. very important, are seen by others as. So what this model is testing or projecting for each individual is a perception that the outside world sees to you. So it is highly possible that I am a hot mess internally and I want to please everyone. But what this test is showing that my answers have stated to the test that my actions towards others are not, or not, that, not, not I don't wanna use not because I don't wanna use a negative, my actions project to others comp um, competitiveness, uh, maybe more aloofness, maybe somebody who's less empathic or slightly um, tougher and less tolerant. These are characteristics that are what the outside world is perceiving of me. But because of the way it's worded, I find I'm okay with that. And I, I went back and reread all of them and I, I found it's less obvious in the other five major categories. But if one goes through carefully and looks at each analysis provided, you will see that what, what it's telling you is not that this is some type of a prediction or validation for your internal self. This is merely a view of how you are perceived by the outside world. And these perceptions are calculated on your honest answers on how you interact with those people and yourself. And I just thought this one just really brought that home for me. Thanks. You so beautifully said, I think that, that that's a big element of it that we're blind to because we only have our only internal perspective. Um, but this this really does does show how the world interacts with us and um, beautifully said. I, 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 thought, I thought that was a great point. I mean, basically. And this is a danger of these tests is that it can mess up with your own kind of authentic connection with yourself if you take them too seriously. So you definitely need to have that anchor of kind of on, honest, kind of authentic, kind of self-awareness uh, and never lose that, that anchor when you're using it. Uh, next up is going to be Ping followed by Pegor. Ping. Okay, so I wanted to say that um, the, I, I was guessing the reason why we have these debates about situational, the answer may change. Um, I was wondering if, if the original test is actually more objectified and more uh, quantitative um, so that there's a much less room for us to give a subjective answer based on our impression. Because you did mention that um, the system is just wanted to 
average out and to let see let us to see a pattern but we were not given this system right so we are based on we gave the answer based on our impressions subjectively and the second question is maybe it's kind of a dumb question but i really wonder why there's such an interest in in personality tests the meyer briggs uh, test uh, also i i've seen this meetup meet every week weeks after weeks in new york city when i was there and i don't know what what they could talk about <laughs> and now it's this test it's like so much interest like why if it's just a guideline and we lived with this body and interact with the human beings or our, our lives why we still have such interest sorry absolutely and i think that this this speaks to how how little we understand ourselves and how complex the human brain is and what i will say is not everyone thinks these tests are interesting it's a very you know many people are just like a this is hogwash B, I don't have time for it. C, how does it even impact my life? Like that's the majority of people. But I do think when you take this subsector of people who are pretty open to new ideas, are pretty intellectually inclined, you do see an, uh, a desire to understand ourselves better in pursuit of sort of some sort of kind of third party goal. So um, you're right, it's it's odd, right? But, but, you know, I think for those high in openness, there's no greater pursuit than kind of understanding the complexity of our brains. And so that's why we kind of tend toward it. Um, I think people also just like to talk about themselves. You know, I, 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 I'm in, in my profession, I, I do a lot of like quizzes, like things where people can just think about themselves because that's what's going on in all of all of our brains. Um, just to, to respond to your first point of kind of just the subjective nature to this, that's why you do see if you take this test several times, your your you know your range might be similar, but you're gonna fall all over the place based on as Pegor said, have you eaten recently? How is your mood? Do you have a bunch of things on your to do list that you're avoiding? That's gonna up your level of neuroticism a lot. So um, there, there's definitely a range here. Pegor, you're next. Yeah, so I wanted to sort of build up of what Maritza said is that, and Peterson has mentioned this, is that you can actually have someone fill the big five test on your behalf. And you can then compare it to your the way you took the test and compare the results. And that, that should be indicative as well. And the second thing I want to say, which is it, the, the discussion started sort of in the beginning of this uh, section is we shouldn't attribute value to these uh, to these scoring. So if someone if, if someone's low on agreeableness, that doesn't mean it's bad. Or if someone's high on agreeableness, that doesn't mean it's good. And the, the example, clear example for this is agreeableness. Because if you're high on agreeableness, that makes you a really good parent or a, or, a, or a caretaker of children specifically. And if you're low in agreeableness, that makes you a really good negotiator. And so that's why I said it's this test helps you understand where you are and then that allows you to place yourself in an appropriate context you know so if you know you're you're high in agreeableness you know that you can be a good uh, parent or you could be maybe work in a nursing home or some kind of like take care facility whereas if you're low in agreeableness you can go i'm going to be a negotiator or a lawyer or something and so there's no inherent judgment or value structure in these personalities. And if you're going to go for like a deeper argument, it's because this, these, these spectrums have sort of emerged out of evolution. Therefore, every version of this combination is valid because otherwise some combinations wouldn't exist. Thanks, uh, Pegor. Um, let's go to the last one now, uh, neuroticism. Great. All right. So if you are high in neuroticism, you are have a tendency to be more anxious. Um, you, there's a more angry hostility. You might be more irritable. You experience stress or negative emotion in general. So don't think about this in, in terms of just anger, but any sort of negative emotion. You might be more self-conscious, more vulnerable, and you're going to experience more dramatic shifts in mood as that self-talk kind of speaks to you. 
someone low in neuroticism doesn't worry as much. They're more calm, emotionally stable. They're confident. They're resilient. They don't so easily tend toward mental illness or feel sad or depressed. Um, again, the classic example here is some babies just cry a lot, right? That neuroticism, I think in particular, is something that is really ingrained in us. Certainly it can be impacted by our experiences. Um, but again, remove the word neurotic. It's not the right qual the, you know, word here. Think about it more in terms of, as, as Shrinkant said, calm or just negative emotion in general. So as we break it down, we have volatility, which includes kind of this angry hostility, impulsiveness, and, and that's it, versus withdrawal, which includes anxiety, depression, self-consciousness, vulnerability, all that kind of negative self-talk wrapped up there. So this one is kind of regulating emotions and versus the ability for consistency and with withdrawal is all that negative, negative emotion. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, so it's going to be Omer, Jean, and Jeff next. Omer, go ahead. Uh, hi, yeah, thank you for that. I just wanted to, um, it, while I was working on myself, trying to understand the concept of this, this uh, neuroticism, again, this, uh, the idea, even though it's been repeatedly told many, many times that there is no judgment, there's no good or bad here. I think most people uh, would agree that maybe one of these mm -hmm. five traits, especially the last one, usually has been considered as more negative than positive. So if you can maybe uh, give a, an example, also Jordan Peterson was talking about like risk averse, like the people who are high, in this uh, neuroticism, they are they're more um, easier to like identify the risk and the you know, threats to protection and all that. But I, based on the description that even in this list, I did not see them as much. So what I've seen is more like, you know, the anxious and, you know, the more like kind of negative aspect. So if you can maybe provide a different overview, what would you say and, and to, to make it like maybe more neutral as opposed to like good or bad? Uh, and what would be the positive uh, aspect of being high in neuroticism? Great question. So I, I think um, when it comes to risk aversion, I would say that someone who's high in, in neuroticism is, is more risk averse. And this is a very great trait to have if you're in a situation where risk exists. Right. So in, in any kind of situation where things aren't going as planned, where there is any kind of external threat, somebody who's low in extroversion, their their internal sensors aren't even going off. Um, I think there's kind of a, a peripheral element of people kind of looking all over the place. You know, you might actually see more things. Um, uh, than others. So I think that absolutely this has, you know, a quality to it. I think that um, I mean, this is just more projecting, but when I look at some of or potentially the greatest artists of all time and the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, you, you do tend to see a tendency toward higher levels of neuroticism because um, I don't know if there's a, a, a creativity component there or an, an IQ component, um, but all I, all I know is like the, the funniest people seem to have the darkest stories. Um, and so I think absolutely we can't put a judgment here. This isn't neurotic. Um, it's, it's, uh, that negative emotion is, it's just as real as anything else. And, um, it makes people's lives, I think more complex, which potentially could be more beautiful. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jean, Jeff and Jairo. Jean, go ahead. Yeah, this one actually is the uh, most confusing one for me. My testing is very high in neuroticism, but I actually, I can easily get angry, but I can pass it well, but I don't really feel depressed or withdrawal or very cautious at all. I actually like to take risks and most of the time very happy. So I'm, I wonder if I did it wrong or like, I can see the big, I'm not a very calm type of person, very emotional, that's, that's true, but the description of all this negative emotion, I don't experience that much, except angry sometimes. So I'm just wondering, you know, what your thoughts on that? This is most unclear one, actually. Yeah, I, I'm, I would be very interested to see how the 
variation is by different age groups because I do think that there is just a an angst that comes with coming of age that just kind of seems to tend out of you but I think that relates a lot to the experiences you've had so if you've traded that anxiety for some sort of life experience or something under your belt you're going to feel a little bit better about it um, and some people you know that certainly never goes away and, and neuroticism really stays with you so I think this goes back to you have a range your range can 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 mediate but you're you're always going to feel more comfortable where you started uh, from what what I heard um, I would say that uh, it's the same kind of issue that uh, Maritza talked about on agreeableness on on uh, and several people have talked about for example what you described Jean is like very it's high on volatility but not high on withdrawal mm -hmm. so that's like so that's why it's much better to look at those 10 characteristics because typically there is a variation. Uh, between them. Uh, next up is going to be, let me see, Jeff followed by Hiro. Jeff, go ahead. Hi, yeah, um, maybe it's because I came from Myers-Briggs, which, which this is the one that they don't have, <laughs> the neuroticism. I'm not, so I don't care too much about the darkness of it. I, I kind of like darkness. And I, so I don't even know I score in this one. But but I'm a little skeptical of it because it feels like it's the measurement of how you're doing how the rest of your personality is working. In other words, it doesn't feel like it's inside of you. It's the situation you're in. If you're in a bad marriage, then you're going to be neurotic, uh, you know, for instance, um, something like that. So it just seems like I'm wondering how this one seems to be the least qualified to be a, an independent variable, so to speak, in describing behavior. Yeah, the, the example I was using recently with someone is like, imagine you are a new parent in a relationship and your kid has an ear infection and there have just, the diaper has exploded all over the wall and they're crying and you have to wake up the next morning. And I think there's many ways to react to that situation. Someone that's higher in neuroticism is going to have a lot of concerns around the future. They're gonna be stressed about this. They're gonna be looking up all the health conditions and all of that. Someone that lower, might be lower in neuroticism might be sort of laughing about it, right? That, there, that there's an element of humor in this and that we can kind of take a breath. So I think absolutely there are, there are always going to be situations that, I mean, inevitably we will all be faced with tragedies in life that will be put us in a place to have a higher level of neuroticism. But that baseline, I think, again, is is intended to, to be there. Okay, uh, last one up is, got it. Uh, Hiro, Hiro, go ahead. So, say uh, I'm a, Jeff Bezos, and I want to uh, engineer my uh, corporation and the people under it to manage them, or, or say I'm, I'm a cult leader, and, or it could be a mainstream religion, and, and I'm the Pope. And so I could apply these, uh, these traits and say, uh, look at uh, these, as uh, it could be, uh, yeah, personalities of, of peoples that I want to manage. And so uh, maybe I, I want to take the neuroticism of people to bring them into the, into the church and then, and then uh, make them agreeable through training and, and conscientious and reduce their openness and reduce their extroversion. So couldn't this be applied to uh, many uh, governments or religious uh, cults or, or corporations? So, uh, so Hiro, I would say firstly, I'm very impressed with your uh, imagination. You've gone between becoming a matchmaker to uh, Bezos running a large corporation to Pope. And or, or a cult leader, so you've got you know you, you're trying to see. Unfortunately, none of these tools are, I think, at a level where you can actually make you know build things like technology uh, that well. These are, I think, very very approximate things, and it's it, they're 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 not at that level. I would say, Claire. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree with you. All right, folks, uh, so now I'm going to start uh, the breakout rooms. Um, I'm going to run the breakout rooms for a short period of time. So uh, 
20 minutes. You're welcome to stay uh, or leave. I know it's late, but um, you're, you're, you know, this is wonderful. Uh, Claire, I thought it worked out very well. Me I too. Thought, uh, we went through this, doing a second pass on each of those things, I think worked very well. We got some very interesting observations about each of them. So thank you very much, everybody. And I'm going to start the breakout rooms now.